Okay. All right. So again, my name is Carter Keating, uh, and I'm going to be going through kind of the basics of interferometry, uh, what it is, how it works, uh, and why you should care. Uh, all right. So picking up where Jonathan left off, assuming that, there we go. Um, all right, so before we get into uh, the actual uh, guts of the radio telescopes, just a couple of things to freshen up your math. Um, so I'll be using a couple of terms here, uh, convolution, cross-correlation, autocorrelation. Um, they mean similar-ish things, um, so it's just important to know what it is that I'm talking about. Uh, so convolution, all three of these things are basically kind of you can imagine as smoothing or sliding things one past another. So in a convolution, if you have, say, a, a, you know, a square box, a top hat function, um, and you have some uh, nice fancy shape, uh, you can imagine kind of sliding it by and doing kind of a multiply, point by point multiply. And you kind of see uh, if you convolve these two functions, the square wave and this triangle wave, you get this kind of almost looks like a, a wave wave uh, kind of function. Um, cross correlation is very similar. Um, mathematically speaking, it's just kind of one of the, the things that is being cross correlated against um, just is flipped in terms of its orientation. Uh, so you turn it around, you slide one against another, you do this kind of point by point multiply uh, and you get out um, basically a similar shape. It's just flipped. Um, and then finally, uh, an autocorrelation is basically that same uh, feature but, or that same operation, but you're basically smoothing or multiplying something against itself. Um, so these autocorrelations should be completely <laughs> symmetric um, because, of course, you're convolving the same function against itself. Uh, another thing, uh, radio astronomy is pretty much powered on Fourier transforms. So this will be the most complicated equation I think I have in the entire talk. Um, basically, you can think of a Fourier transform as being uh, taking a function and then correlating that against a bunch of sine waves and cosine waves um, and spitting out basically a spectrum. Um, you'll hear maybe the term FFT get brought up uh, a couple of times during the talks today. An FFT is just a fast Fourier transform. It's a way to do a Fourier transform with regularly sampled data in a fairly fast way. Um, if, you, if that data set meets certain criterion, um, usually you like it to be a factor of two. Um, factors of three uh, or five are also good. Um, but basically, it's just a way of getting that done, a Fourier transform done fast. Um, the reason why we do Fourier transforms is that uh, we have things in one domain, say like the time domain or the spatial domain, uh, and we're interested in putting things into a frequency domain, particularly spectroscopists in the room like to see things versus frequency. Um, and so uh, I kind of think of these things in terms of shapes. Uh, and so here's kind of a nice little table of different shapes if you put in what the Fourier transform of that that comes out is. So if you put in a square wave, uh, you see you get this kind of weird wavy pattern called a sync pattern. Uh, you put it in a triangle wave, you get a sync squared pattern. Um, Gaussians are nice because Gaussian in, Gaussian out, you'll get the same exact shape, um, or you'll get the same shape coming in, although the width of that shape will be slightly different. Um, impulses uh, will, uh, if they're centered at zero frequency, um, will just correspond to a DC level. Um, so you'll just see a constant value across all frequency values. Uh, same thing, vice versa, uh, something that's the same power at all time intervals collapses down to a single frequency. Um, and if you put in something that looks like a sine wave or a cosine wave, uh, you'll see uh, power come out uh, at both the positive and negative frequencies. So it's kind of this weird, interesting feature that the Fourier transform, uh, when you're dealing with uh, symmetric data, uh, you have things that will come out at positive and negative frequencies. Um, and finally, I don't know that this will ever come up, but if you put in a bunch of deltas, a bunch of spikes um, at regularly sampled intervals, you will get back out a bunch of delta functions, a bunch of spikes. Um, last thing um, is this thing called the convolution theorem. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, well, it's pretty simple when it's up here. Going through the derivation is a bit more complex, 
But all it says is that if you take the Fourier transform uh, of two functions convolved one against another, um, the result is the same as if you were to take the Fourier transform of each of those functions independently and then just doing a point by point multiply. Um, this is really nice because doing a point by point multiply from a computational stamp standpoint is actually very light, whereas doing a convolution requires lots and lots of operations. So the convolution requires, if you have n samples, uh, convolution typically takes n squared operations, whereas a point by point multiply only requires n. So maybe you can see why it becomes advantageous very quickly if you can take advantage of the cor uh, convolution theorem if there's something that you're trying to convolve or correlate against. All right, so uh, back to the big question. What is an interferometer? Uh, so kind of picking up where Jonathan left off, uh, we're here in radio astronomy land, so we deal with uh, antennas, not the grammatically <coughs> proper antennae. Um, we have one antenna that's here out in the middle of nowhere. Um, that doesn't do any good for interferometry. In fact, we need two antennas together to form a baseline. Um, and these antennas are ideally looking at something. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, we stick a monochromatic source out at infinite distance. Monochromatic basically just meaning it's only broadcasting at a single frequency. It's fixed in position. It is always broadcasting the same frequency um, time and time again. And so from that source, um, radio waves will come in. Uh, if the source is far enough away, what will happen is that basically the radio waves coming in will come in uh, as planar waves, so almost like uh, sheets of rain, which those of you new to Hilo, hopefully you've learned in the last day what sheets of rain look like. Um, I'm sure there'll be more examples in the next couple of days. Um, but you can see it's a very simple, um, this is basically what the electric field is doing. It's basically jostling up or back and forth uh, as it's making its way to the two antennas. Uh, these two antennas are hooked up to some cabling, um, something that can actually carry the radio waves uh, back to this thing that we call a correlator uh, or a mixer. And out from that mixer, we get this data output, um, the interferometer response um, that has this variable, uh, basically this variable thing as a function of time. Um, so this is actually something that you can build uh, basically just at home. Um, if you've ever had a, a TV antenna, TV antenna uh, works as an antenna. It picks up radio waves. Uh, you pick up some coax cable. You can buy your own little mixer um, and basically ho hook up your little mixer to a voltmeter um, and actually measure uh, this. This interferometric response is basically just the voltage product that's coming from these two antennas. So. Um, what exactly is the interferometer response? Um, so let's say, uh, look, thinking about this in terms of voltage that's measured. Uh, at the first antenna, we have, you know, as a function of time, we have light coming in at some particular frequency new. Um, that voltage is obviously oscillating as a function of time. Um, at antenna B, you've got the same similar function, uh, a cosine two pi nu times t, plus this little delta term. And this little delta term arises from the fact that if you look at the path that the light has to travel, the antenna that's on the left-hand side, the light hits just a little bit earlier uh, than the light that's on the right-hand side. Basically, the length of the path that's common um, to both antennas is this orange piece that's here. Um, but the light has to travel this extra little distance, this red distance that's up here. Um, and you can define basically what these distances are. Um, and uh, basically, it depends on a couple of different things. Uh, one is the elevation angle, so how high up in the sky you are, where 90 degrees is straight up and zero degrees is the horizon. Um, and it depends basically on the, in this simple example, where you've got two antennas that are separated by some distance d, uh, basically just depends on d times the cosine of that elevation angle. Um, we sometimes, this big D, we sometimes call the baseline vector or the unprojected baseline distance. Um, and then this D is basically just sine times that elevation angle. Uh, it is, um, if you were ignoring kind of radial distance, what from the source's point of view, how far um, perpendicularly separated the two antennas <laughs> between the feed. 
Um, why that matters, uh, we'll get into a little bit later. So, uh, like I said, we have a mixer and a mixer's whole job is to basically multiplying the two incoming sine or cosine waves coming in. Uh, and so you can actually uh, do this math yourself and actually see what the output of uh, the voltage output from the mixer is going to be. And you get two terms here. So there's one piece that comes out at double the frequency that's uh, the incoming light that was coming in. That's this piece. And then there's this other piece that actually remains static as a function of time. Um, and this is kind of interesting because it really only depends on this geometric path delay piece that's up here, this tau sub g. So uh, voltage meters or any detection device, obviously, or generally speaking, will always average over some period of time. Um, and we're always interested in averaging as much data as we can. So if you average this for a little bit of time, you'll find that the time variable piece basically completely goes away. And so that the actual interferometer response that we're interested in is basically this cosine something times the geometric path delay. This is the thing that we're basically trying to measure. This is the thing that we're really interested in. So uh, now that we have a formula for what this thing looks like up on the sky, and the next question is, okay, what, how do we use this? What comes out? So um, let's imagine that I can put a source in a couple of different places and let's see what happens. Um, so if you stick the source straight up in the sky, so directly at Zenith, uh, there is no path delay for the two antennas. Cosine of 90 degrees is zero. Last time I checked, zero times anything is zero. And so uh, you get cosine of zero, which is equal to one or positive value. Um, so the voltage that actually that you measure coming out of this mixer device will be a positive value. You can imagine I, maybe I change the elevation angle a little bit to some other position in the sky. Um, and I get out something that looks like zero voltage. And I can basically put it at yet another position and actually measure out a negative voltage out of this mixer. I can actually trace out a pattern in the sky uh, using this formula and basically show what the voltage <coughs> out of this particular mixer is going to be as a position uh, or as a function of position on the sky. And so this is basically what you will see if you are able to move around with kind of impunity a single monochromatic source at roughly <coughs> infinite distance moving at different positions in the sky. You see this pattern. Uh, this is, if you ever hear the term fringes or fringe pattern, this is the thing that we're talking about. And this is really the thing that powers radio astronomy, or I should say radio interferometry. Um, so you've got sources, sources that are in the kind of positive parts of the voltage pattern that's here, contribute positively to the mixer output. Pieces that are in the negative piece contribute negatively to the mixer output. And so the thing that actually comes out is the actual thing that's up on the sky multiplied by this pattern and out comes a single voltage number. And that's the thing that actually we're trying to measure that's up on the sky. Um, so that's great for determining things that are in the kind of negative and po positive peaks of this pattern. You might ask yourself, well, what happens at those zero crossings? Uh, well, you can actually introduce a little delay, a little path delay um, about 90 degrees uh, inside the instrument itself, set it off to its own separate mixer, and actually get the corresponding, so you can think of the, the first pattern, that blue pattern as being a sine, or a cosine pattern, the second pattern being a sine pattern so that it's zero directly at zenith. Um, this is uh, sometimes referred to as the imaginary output of the sky, um, whereas the first pattern, that cosine pattern, is the real pattern on the sky. And so we can have real correlators and imaginary correlators. Uh, just a side note, real and imaginary is really just shorthand for cosine and sine. There are no imaginary photons. <laughs> there are no imaginary values. Uh, it's just a mathematical simplicity. Um, so imaginary things are actually real. They're just uh, imaginary in the mathematical sense. So uh, typically speaking, uh, you can actually have two separate correlators that record this output. Uh, what's more common is actually these things get combined into one correlator that actually does both the real and imaginary pieces. And so we just have the one correlator output here. Just for simplicity's sake, I'm only plotting the cosine pattern up here. 
uh, but know that a correlator is capable of, of producing both. All right, so this is nice. We have a tool to measure something up in the sky. And so how can we stretch this? How can we play around with it to kind of measure something new, measure something else? Well, uh, if you look at this equation that's up here, one of the things that the uh, voltage pattern depends on uh, is the distance of the baseline, um, how far separated these two antennas are. And so if you increase the separation of two antennas, what you'll find is actually that the fringe pattern actually moves faster in the sky. And so you can get a different sine and cosine pattern by moving and changing the separation between two antennas. Uh, this is actually kind of exciting because if you have a bunch of things that can measure sine and cosine patterns all across the sky, that is kind of the definition of what the Fourier transform of the sky looks like. That is a Fourier transform of the sky. And so with the inverse Fourier transform, you can get almost exactly an exact reconstruction of what the sky looks like, given that you have all of the measurements, all of the, the potential distances between the baselines. Um, there are some important caveats here. The most important, which of being that if you have something that stretches across the entire sky over a very large area, the positive and negative contributions cancel out. So you never recover what's the so-called zero spacing information. Uh, so things like the CMB, which are present all across the sky, an interferometer doesn't see the, the bulk CMB piece, the 2.7 uh, Kelvin brightness temperature piece, um, in the same way that a single dish definitely detects it as a, as a background to its measurements. Um, the overall resolution of an interferometer is basically set by the observing wavelength uh, divided by the kind of maximal distance of uh, two antennas separated from one another. Uh, and so this is actually one of the really nice things is that you can get really high resolution just by having your antennas really widely separated. <coughs> All right, so uh, that's the distance piece. Um, the more astute observers amongst you might also notice that there is this other piece that can be varied uh, which is the wavelength or the frequency of light that's coming in. So to start with, we originally said that this was only a monochromatic single frequency transmitter. Let's make it uh, multi-frequency, uh, multi-chromatic. I don't know what the right term there is. Uh, so we've got radio waves that are coming in. They're much more complex. It's not just a simple sine or cosine pattern. So what does that do for you now? Well, the longer wavelength that the light is, the slower the fringe pattern actually gets on the sky. So this is another way to potentially get information about what the sky looks like without having to move the two antennas. There is an interesting caveat here that if you look at, say you have a telescope that's capable of looking at multiple colors up in the sky, you'll say, see the red, green, blue fringes that are up there corresponding to three different frequencies of light, or three different wavelengths of light. And you'll notice that kind of in the center at zenith, those patterns all line up, they're all nice, they're all positively contribute. Um, but if I go a little bit further off, kind of over to the right hand side here, you'll see that they actually are capable of canceling each other out. And it's not that there's nothing there, it's that the different wavelengths of light that our interferometer might be sensitive to can actually cancel each other out because different frequencies have different fringe rates across the sky. This is even more problematic because radio telescopes typically don't see the entire sky all at once. And so we typically point our telescopes towards the thing that we're interested in. Uh, and our telescopes have a finite field of view. Uh, we sometimes refer to it as the primary beam. Uh, it is the full width half max. So basically you go from the peak of the kind of forward sensitivity of the telescope and go out to as far out as it takes to reach 50% of that sensitivity. Um, and the telescope basically only sees this kind of roughly maximum angular diameter in the sky. And so you may actually see nothing for your source that's up in the sky simply because of where you're pointed and the different frequencies canceling each other out. Um, so radio astronomers, knowing that this is an issue, say, well, okay, uh, we don't have to just have these cables sitting there statically. We can introduce um, and correct for the geometric delay, 
um, on the sky and actually change the fringe pattern that looks like something like this to something that looks like this. So you're actually coherent on that position in the sky. And in fact, we tend to do this not just for one position in the sky, but for all the different positions that the antennas point to. Um, we refer to this as fringe rotation, fringe stopping, fringe tracking. Um, fringe dash anything typically refers to something related to the fact that we change the delays to correct for the fact that there is this um, bulk delay piece that's, uh, or there's this delay, path length delay uh, that can cause decoherence basically. Um, so the geometric delay is something that is basically caused by the antennas being in different positions and the source being at different positions in the sky. The instrumental bulk delay, different cables can have different lengths. And so we have to compensate for that also. Now, I said that these sources are now multi-frequency and that changing the delay uh, causes them to cancel out. So there's a little bit of interesting coolness that we can do with that little piece of information. So um, right now I have this only to set up to measure one set of delays. One single delay uh, gets measured by this current set of telescopes, this current baseline. But let's say I have the capability of injecting not just one path length delay, but multiple path length delays, one that corresponds to the exact correction um, needed in order to correct for the geometric delay uh, at that position in the sky, and then a couple others um, around that relative delay, plus or minus some amount of time. Um, so the thing that you get out is what we call sometimes the lag spectrum. And so you measure different voltages coming out of this lag spectrum. Um, and you can see that uh, most for this particular source that we're looking at, most of the response is around zero, except for just around zero, uh, zero added delay, we see this big spike. Um, hopefully you remember back to your Fourier transforms. Uh, if you take the Fourier transform of this, you go from a lag spectrum to an actual frequency spectrum, um, and you get out a spectrum for what that baseline is seeing. Um, and so you can see this little FFT block that's down here that's doing the Fourier transform. This is how interferometers get spectral information. We basically take advantage of the fact that different frequencies can and will interfere with each other. And we measure that, and by the magic of a Fourier transform, we can actually get out what the spectrum of the source looks like. So if we see a lag spectrum that looks like a sine or a cosine wave, that'll spit out something that looks like a single spike. So that would be like a spectral line source, a continuum source, uh, will mostly have all of its power at the zero lag position um, and will spit out something that has power at all frequencies. Um, so uh, a couple of different terms here. So spectral window is the entire window set of frequencies that we have access to. Um, here at the SMA, we refer to it by a couple of different ways, a chunk, quadrant, segment, block. All of those things, unfortunately, refer to the same thing. Um, and then a channel is basically a single frequency value inside a spectral window. Um, the bandwidths for those two things are set by the number of different sample delays that you measure in the lag spectrum and what the spacing of those lags is. So the, uh, the bandwidth of, the, of an individual channel uh, is the delay sampling uh, one over the number of samples times the individual lags for each sample. Um, the total bandwidth, um, if you're taking complex samples, uh, it's one over just a single uh, lag interval. Uh, otherwise, it's one over two, uh, two times the lag interval uh, for what's called a real only, which is, I think, most correlators. Although there are correlators that exist, including one on Mauna Loa, uh, which is a complex samples, or it takes complex samples. Um, so uh, this red term here on the, on the right-hand side uh, is the Nyquist sampling theorem, uh, which I think Ranjani is going to talk about a little bit later on the correlator talk. Uh, and one other thing, so this thing that I've set up uh, kind of down here on, uh, in blue, that's what we typically call an XF correlator. So we multiply first, and then we take a Fourier transform. Again, by the magic of the convolution theorem, you can actually take the Fourier transform first and then multiply it out and basically get the same answer. 
Um, so that's referred to as an FX correlator versus an XF correlator. They both output the same thing. They have slightly different responses and slightly different amounts of uh, work that needs to be done to build them, but they're both outputting basically the same thing, a spectrum. All right, so taking all the pieces that we now have, this is the actual uh, response of the interferometer. So RAB um, is equal to GA times <laughs> complex conjugate of GB times this weird V thing plus epsilon. <laughs> so defining terms here for a little bit. <laughs> Uh, R is the uh, actual output of the interferometer. G of A and G of B are uh, what we sometimes call the gain factor or the gains of the individual antennas. Basically, gain, antennas have their own responses to things. They have amplifiers, they have mixers, they have all sorts of components, which imparts on that baseline some amplitude and some phase characteristics. So these are G sub A and G sub B are basically the pieces of the interferometer response that the antenna as an instrument imparts onto what it is that we're measuring. There's this V piece, which is what we call the true visibility or the visibility of the baseline. This is the thing that we're actually trying to measure. Um, it's generally as a function of a kind of X and Y position or U and V uh, in the coordinate system that we typically use. Uh, and finally, on the very far right hand side, that epsilon, that's the noise of the interferometer. Uh, and that's the thing that should hopefully get smaller with time, whereas everything else, aside from the noise, should hopefully remain stable, at least over the order of seconds to minutes. So when we build our correlator, we typically sum together over multiple measurements. Um, at the SMA, it tends to be tens of seconds, uh, because we trust that everything on the left-hand side remains constant, and the noise should just go down over those tens of seconds. And then the output of the correlator gets put into our archive, which is the thing that you actually look at. All right, so what is this epsilon, this noise thing all about, um, and how is it exactly defined, or what, it, what value should it take on? Uh, so this is what's called a radiometer equation. Um, it's a generic equation that's true for any radio detector device. Um, you have a couple of different terms here, but using my fancy dancy uh, coloring technique here. Uh, so the output RMS noise in this brightness temperature units um, is roughly equal to the sum of the system temperature, which I'll talk about in a second, plus the antenna temperature on the sky. So that's the kind of average radiation temperature that you measure up in the sky, uh, divided by the square root of the product of the total bandwidth times integration time. Uh, bandwidth measured in hertz, integration time measured in seconds. Um, so this is actually what, for a basically what a single dish, what the sensitivity would be of the single telescope. Um, so there's two important pieces here. One is that that T of A, again, is really what's coming in from the sky. So if you were detecting the CMB, which is at roughly three Kelvin, T sub A would be three, three Kelvin. The system temperature thing, though, is a little bit weirder. And so the easiest way that I have to describe it is um, the system temperature is basically defined as if you had a piece of absorber um, that was at the temperature of the system temperature um, and you placed it in front of the telescope. A perfect absorber is also a perfect emitter, a perfect black body. It's one of Kirchhoff's laws, right? Um, and so if you put that absorber or that emitter, that black body emitter, right in front of the telescope, um, the telescope would see double the amount of power um, that it had with just the system temperature alone. So you can imagine that this is kind of sort of physically related to the temperature that the, the what we call the calibrator load would have to be um, in order to double the power coming out. It's basically just a very nice, easy, convenient way to describe what the system noise is in a way that we can actually physically measure. Um, you can put a hot load in, you can heat something up, you can cool it down with liquid nitrogen. Um, this, this is something that we actually do. All right, so that's for a single dish. For an interferometer, uh, this is the equation that we're particularly interested in. Uh, so again, we're looking at the RMS noise now in units of Janskys, uh, or typically uh, described in units of Janskys, uh, is equal to this expression over here. This K is Boltzmann constant. Uh, we're assuming that the antenna temperature is roughly uh, close to zero, or at least it's much less than the system temperature. So I've just made that approximation here. Um, and finally, in the bottom part of this, because of flux density, 
has per meter squared down in the bottom, um, we have this uh, area effective, uh, which is basically the geometric area of the telescope multiplied by what we call the aperture efficiency, this eta. Uh, basically, systems are not perfectly efficient, and in fact, the dishes are designed not to be completely illuminated um, for reasons that maybe uh, Ram is going to talk about a little bit later, um, but it has to basically do with, a four, with more Fourier transforms. Um, this is ultimately what the sensitivity of the interferometer is, um, and this is the thing that's the most interesting. Uh, this is only for a single baseline, and so this number, uh, if you have multiple baselines for a telescope, this number gets divided by the square root of the number of baselines. Um, and so roughly the total sensitivity of an array is sigma s divided by square root of number of baselines. Uh, there are a couple of caveats on that, but this is first order, uh, basically what you expect to see out of an array of telescopes. All right, so real quick, why do interferometry? Um, now that you know what an interferometer is, um, one is that a 100 meter baseline is definitely a lot cheaper to build than a 100 meter telescope, um, certainly more than a 500 meter telescope or a 12,000 kilometer uh, telescope. Uh, which we'll talk about tomorrow, or I can say Jeff will talk about tomorrow. Um, interferometers are nice because they're a little bit more reconfigurable, both in terms of their spectral and spatial resolution. Um, there are lots of things that are nice when your data averages down to zero. Uh, for single dish, uh, things don't average down to zero, they average down to some baseband power level, and so you have to be very careful about things like 1 over F noise uh, and dealing with all sorts of weird systematics. Uh, in an interferometer, all the data should average down to, all the noise uh, and even some systematics should average down to zero, uh, which makes some things a lot simpler. Uh, and the other nice thing is that for a single receiver, you kind of natively get multi-pixel images. Uh, you don't have to slew the telescopes around. You can just point at a single position on the sky and you get a multi-pixel image out, whereas if you point a single dish at a single position on the sky, it's a one-pixel camera, right? Uh, so you don't necessarily get multi-pixel images out. Uh, there are a couple of disadvantages with an interferometer, mostly relating to sensitivity. 100 meter baseline is not nearly as sensitive as a 100 meter dish, um, and we can't use incoherent detectors, so things like bolometers, uh, which tend to be a bit more sensitive just in terms of raw sensitivity. Um, data processing is a bit more complex, as uh, some of you will learn later this week. Um, both for the real-time and offline aspects. Um, and as I said kind of earlier on, interferometers are not sensitive to the so-called zero spacing, very large spatial scales on the sky. You're only sensitive to things that are basically the size of the field of view of the telescope and smaller. All right, so that's it. Uh, any questions? Can you actually go back to your last slide, please? Yeah. So you mentioned that, you know, one of the disadvantages of doing interferometry is that these interferometers can't recover these very, you know, the larger spatial scales and that we're roughly <laughs> limited to the primary beam size. And so I'm wondering, um, my question has to do with you just in the practical, being a real world radio astronomer. How much do you see folks when they are doing research using a combination of interferometers and single dishes in order to make up with this limiting factor? It's a good question. Uh, so the it, it depends a little bit on the science subject, um, but there's a good number of people, I think, who actually regularly combine single dish data with interferometric data. It's, I think it's probably most common for things that are galactic sources because they just tend to be bigger on the sky. Um, but I do know some extra galactic people who are also interested in things that are, you know, bigger in size. And so you're actually interested in structures that are several arc minutes across. Um, where you really, but have really fine structure detail where you really want to have both a single dish or you want to have the very large spatial modes and you want to have the fine structure detail. So yeah, it's a good number of people who, who like to do both. Chris. I came from the optical world and when you're setting up an optical test bed, you also look for fringes. When you're, we use the Michelson interferometer. So when I came here, I thought, oh, I know what an interferometer is. But I've still been unable to like connect the two, like how an optical fringe 
Uh, yeah, so it's it's the best way I've heard this described is it's like that Michelson interferometer or the two slit interferometer, but in reverse. Yeah. So things that are coming from the positive fringes on the sky go through the two slits or through the two legs of the interferometer and get combined and can be detected. Uh, it's a little bit weird because, of course, you only get a single number out, whereas a, a normal optical interferometer, you can see multiple positions. Yeah. Um, but that's actually where that uh, being able to control the delay, you kind of are able to recover that little extra piece of information. So I have two questions. The first one is considering this one. I think I'm a bit confused about the sensitivity and resolution. So say, for example, for 100 meter baseline, mm -hmm. telescope and a single dish. Uh, the resolution is the same, right? The resolution, yes. Uh, hypothetically speaking, the resolution on the, the angular resolution on the sky is the same. Yeah. Yeah. So say if we have a Earth size actual telescope, mm -hmm. what's the difference of the image that we can take between this telescope and the current one we have? Like the EHD one. You mean the the difference between uh, the, the EHT and like the SMA? The EHT and a possible actual Earth. Side ah, side okay. Side. So the there are two big differences. One is that so the EHT kind of slowly fills in the gaps in the what's so <clears throat> the synthesized aperture of the telescope. But there are still, with any interferometer, there's always gaps, so-called gaps in the UV coverage, which are similar to basically like a telescope missing panels. And so your point spread function, what a point source looks like on the sky, rather than being like a nice Gaussian thing, actually has all this weird, complex, um, but mathematically calculable structure, uh, which I think David is going to sh probably show a lot of this in his lecture later on imaging. So the imaging is a little bit different, but if you were to fill the entire, well, if you had, were able to recover all of those positions, um, the biggest difference essentially would be uh, sensitivity because all of those, over the course of a day, uh, the earth rotates and so different pieces of different baselines get into different positions. So you're able to kind of have coverage averaged over the course of a day, but not all of those panels exist simultaneously. And so you don't have at any one given instance, the maximum amount of collecting area, forward collecting area with the telescope is limited by just the telescopes that are in the array. So if you have 100 10 meter antennas, then your collecting area is 10,000 square meters, give or take, right? And that's, that's just what the sensitivity is. That's just what you're able to detect on the sky. Whereas if you have something that's, you know, tens of thousands of kilometers across, you have much more collecting area you're able to actually collect all of those photons that are hitting the Earth. Yeah. And so you have many, many orders of magnitude, more photons essentially to all combine together. Okay, so in terms of the final, say, image we take, so it will be, uh, how would the so, difference? So the, yeah, so the, you can think of it as the, you can get images that are roughly of the same quality in terms of their resolution, but an interferometer versus something that's completely filled in will almost always have a noisier image okay. versus a single dish. Okay. okay. Yeah, it goes back to the noise equation that he showed with that AF, the effective area. <laughs> okay. Basically, it yeah. accounts for the, the, air, the collecting area of the, of the telescope. Um, so if you have a lot of small antennas, it's not the same as if you have a huge, it's by radius square, right? Okay. Okay, so my se second question is, the, uh, can you go back to the, um, uh, the coherent slide? So on the top, you have these equations, right, for different frequencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one, uh, the previous uh, two or three, I think. This one? Yeah, this one. So this, the top uh, uh, plot is for frequency, right? Uh, it's for a different, uh, the, the x-axis is, is position on the sky. Oh, it's position on yeah. frequency. And so the different colors correspond to different frequencies. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So we're a little over on time, so I'm going to say let's stop there and break for break. Um, and we'll start back up again at 30 uh, with the second.
interferometer lecture with uh, Chijo. I really disagree.